Hello and welcome to So You Want to Be a Doctor. This is a special program to help you understand what it's like to work as a doctor. My name is Professor Arnie Hill. I'm head of the School of Medicine at Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. And in this series, we'll be introducing you to several different doctors. We'll introduce you to an obstetrician, a neurosurgeon, and an orthopedic surgeon. And we'll even explain what all those complex terms are. At the end of this episode, I'm going to take live questions from you from the contact addresses on the screen. Twitter, Facebook, or email us at hashtag or CSI be a doc. Now, let's go to our first doctor. It's Fergal Malone. He's an obstetrician and gynecologist who works at the Rotunda Hospital in Dublin and in the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. Fergal specializes in looking after mums who are delivering their babies. It's a wonderful area with lots of emotion and lots of happiness. Let's go to Fergal. Hello, my name is Fergal Malone. I'm a consultant obstetrician gynecologist at the Rotunda Hospital. I'm the Professor and Chair of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. I knew I wanted to be an obstetrician probably halfway through medical school when I first got uh, exposure to uh, obstetrics as a specialty. The specialty of obstetrics looks after the health care of women and their unborn children. Thankfully, the vast majority of women have uncomplicated normal pregnancies. However, in a significant number of cases, pregnant women develop complications in pregnancy. These may be women who already have medical conditions such as diabetes who happen to get pregnant. Or it can be women who are pregnant who develop new complications related to pregnancy. For example, high blood pressure in pregnancy. And sometimes pregnancies are just complicated. For example, if it's a twin or a triplet pregnancy. My particular area in obstetrics is called maternal fetal medicine. And that's looking after complicated pregnancies and pregnancies in which the baby may have a problem. Sometimes when we find out that babies are in danger in the womb, we might even have to operate on the babies within the mother's womb. And we can do this now quite easily through tiny microscopic surgical instruments. A typical working day as an obstetrician is a long day. It typically might start at around 6 a.m. as you come into the hospital to see the patients who came in overnight. We have busy clinics, both routine clinics seeing patients for their antenatal visits, but also complicated clinics when patients are referred to us from all over the country with fetal abnormalities or mothers who have problems. During these busy clinics, we're frequently called out urgently to attend the labor ward where a patient might need help in delivering her baby or there might be a need for an emergency cesarean section. And then from time to time during the week, we're called upon when patients are transferred into the hospital from outside to undergo a special life-saving surgery for the baby in the womb. And then throughout all of this time, because we work in a teaching hospital, we have large numbers of both medical students and doctors in training. And throughout all of this, we need to keep moving forward research in obstetrics and gynecology for new studies that will improve healthcare for women and their children. Obstetrics and gynecology is a particularly challenging but very rewarding specialty. Not only do obstetricians need to know about general healthcare and medicine, but obstetricians also need to have surgical skills because we operate on pregnant women. In addition, obstetricians need to know about radiology. We do ultrasound scans of all of our pregnant patients. And you need to be very up to speed on genetics and pediatric care. It's a special privilege, day in, day out, looking after healthy people delivering healthy babies. Very few things can give you the sense of reward and the sense of professional satisfaction that comes with that. In particular, in those rare cases when we are called upon to look after a pregnant woman or a baby who's in trouble, to be able to turn a potentially tragic situation into something completely different, positive outcome for mother and baby is amazingly rewarding. There's very little like it. One of our goals at RCSI is to encourage as many of our best and brightest medical students 
to pursue a career in obstetrics and gynaecology. While I may be biased, I strongly believe it's the best medical specialty there is. I would strongly encourage every secondary school student who might have any possible interest in medicine to pursue that goal. Don't be put off just because it appears as if it's long hours of study or very high points. The rewards, the professional rewards, the professional sense of satisfaction, the changes in so many people's lives that you can make by a relatively small investment of time in fourth, fifth and sixth year in secondary school is absolutely worthwhile and is well within the reach of many of our students. Thank you very much, Virgil. Very exciting there, all those new babies and what a wonderful uh, career that must be. But let's look at different aspects. We know in surgery that training surgeons is pretty important. But there are doctors who actually spend some of their time in training other surgeons. And that's what we do at RCSI. We train other doctors to be healthcare leaders. Let's go to another colleague, Dr. Emma Tong. She's in Beaumont Hospital and she's responsible for training our undergraduate medical students. Emma is spending a number of years as a lecturer in the RCSI. Let's go to Emma. My name is Dr. Emma Tong and I'm a clinical lecturer in surgery uh, in Beaumont Hospital for uh, the Royal College of Surgeons. All through my school days I was very much a problem solver. I loved tackling puzzles. Medicine was essentially having abstract problems become something concrete. You had to figure out what was wrong with your patient and then you had to come up with a solution how to fix the problem. You know, with a patient you're making them better, you're making them happy and I think it gives you the most amazing job satisfaction which I don't think any other job can give you. So before I started my clinical lecturing job I um, completed my basic surgical training so that was three years and I, in your basic surgical training you do lots of different specialties so I did orthopaedic surgery which is bone and joint surgery, I did cardiothoracic surgery which is heart and lung surgery, and I did plastic surgery which is a lot of reconstruction and skin cancer and I also did general surgery so it's kind of everything inside the tummy so I've literally been everywhere in the body. So my average day I'd start at 7 and 7.30 in the morning, some days I'd have outpatient clinics and other days I'd have operating theatre. Usually we'd have a mix of large lectures, so we have a special mannequins and things for the students to practice on and then for the more senior students we'd actually go into the hospital and then we'd also take the students into the, the surgery department. If I am on call then you're sent down to the emergency department which some people don't like but I do enjoy the hustle and bustle. The most exciting aspect probably is the emergency trauma. So when you see a very sick patient whether it be an accident or they've come in um, from a car crash or something like that into the emergency department and they're very very sick and you have a huge team around them making them better and they may need surgery or they may need medical intervention bringing them through that stage from being incredibly unwell and then seeing them walking out of the hospital well again that's incredibly satisfying I think anyone can do medicine I honestly believe that definitely in my class there are people from all walks of life skills I think that you need to have, I think like any profession you need to be a hard worker and you need to be dedicated. The only way I think to have them naturally is to love what you do and if you love what you do you will, you will always strive. Um, other than that obviously you're dealing with people all the time whether that be nurses, patients, admin staff etc so you do have to be very much a people person. I can't recommend studying medicine enough. You're not just being qualified to be a doctor. Um, there are so many avenues you can go down, such as teaching, such as research. We're not going to find new cures for cancers and diabetes unless people go into research. What people don't realise, I think, about a degree in medicine is that you can travel the world. It opens up so many doors and there are so many avenues that you can go down. Thank you very much, Emma. As you can see, it's important to train surgeons, and some doctors do that. That's what they do, they specialize in training others. Let's move on to our next specialty, somebody who looks after the ear, the nose, and the throat, an ENT surgeon. And we have one of those here in RCSI Dublin. It's Professor Paul O'Neill. Let's go to Paul and see what he does for a career. My name is James Paul O'Neill. 
Uh, I'm professor of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, or ENT. Uh, and I've been working in Beaumont and RCSI for one year. Uh, what I often say to junior surgeons, if you don't know what to do in surgery, but you know you want to be a surgeon, well consider ENT. And the reason why I say that is that there's a lot of specialties such as uh, paediatric ENT. So you could be involved in helping babies uh, breathe properly. You could be involved in reconstructing paediatric airways. We have also skull-based surgery, so anterior or the front of the skull base, and that would involve a lot of uh, nasal or rhinology surgery. We also have lateral skull base, so that would really involve the ear and all of the diseases that uh, can be associated with that. We also have laryngology, which is directly related to disorders of the voice box. And then finally, we have head and neck cancer surgery. So that essentially is any cancer that extends from the skull base uh, down to the level of the lungs. So surgery always attracted me because there's the mix of emergency and elective work. Cancer surgery always interests me because it's an opportunity to get up close and personal uh, with tumors to try and work out how to take them out. And also it's a time when you really develop a great relationship with your patients because clearly it's, it's a very emotive time for a patient. It's, it's a time when they need uh, direction and they need support. You as their doctor and as their surgeon can really offer that to them. The nice thing about my job is there is no really typical day. In general, my day will uh, involve uh, maybe operating surgery, uh, it'll involve teaching, so I'll teach either by giving a lecture or when I'm operating I'll also have students that'll be uh, either scrubbed in or standing behind me in the operating room. So teaching is really an integral part of my job. Uh, later on the day then normally uh, we'll have some sort of a meeting regarding research. We obviously uh, try to expand research uh, in our department and in RCSI, and RCSI really values research. The great thing that surgeons get to do is play with gadgets, tools that are used during surgeries. In head and neck cancer surgery in recent years, robotic surgery really has taken off. I was very lucky to have a year using uh, what's called the Da Vinci robot. It's where you're performing your surgery, but you're in the corner of the room with your back to the patient. And because it's in 3D, you actually feel like you're standing you know, in the patient's mouth as you perform that surgery. Another area now that, that we deal with is laser surgery. And again, that's another opportunity to use a laser to remove tumors that might be you know, a foot away. Uh, it's an opportunity to do really precise surgery. Working in a hospital is a pressurized environment. Working as a doctor is, is a pressurized career. There's no question about that. And there are very definite highs. My favorite part of working in a hospital is undoubtedly when I'm scrubbed in theater and uh, we're in the middle of an operation and we're progressing well doing the operation. Uh, that's a great feeling. It's, it's a feeling where um, you can feel the weight of your training behind you um, and you know that you're making a real difference for a patient. But it would be wrong to say there aren't lows too. There are because not everyone gets better. Um, and there are moments where uh, people that you become very close to um, don't do well uh, or maybe get recurrent disease. And having those conversations with people and trying to maintain your composure when you've really built up a strong relationship with them is very challenging. However, overall, uh, the whole experience is incredible. I think it's a great honor to be a doctor and I loved every moment of my undergraduate training. It's a very challenging course, but there's huge opportunities that come with that. Uh, opportunities to meet lots of different types of people, opportunities to specialize in lots of different aspects of medicine or surgery, an opportunity to travel the world. So I'm delighted, I'm privileged uh, to be part of it. I would recommend it to anyone who uh, feels that it's their calling. It is vocational, uh, and we live in a cynical world, but it is. But if you feel like you want to incorporate your scientific knowledge uh, and help care for people, uh, and that's your passion, go for it. So thank you very much, Fergal, Paul and Emma, for giving us those really exciting insights into what they do every day as practicing doctors. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We're going to take your live questions very, very shortly. Just a reminder, first of all, firstly, if you have any more questions, Twitter, Facebook or email, hashtag RCSIBeADoc is a way to contact us. We'll be back very shortly with the live stream, but firstly, I want to put a date in your diary. Wednesday, the 9th of December, we'll be back with episode two of So You Want to Be a Doctor. Stay with us and we'll be with you for the live questions in just a moment. So when somebody asks me what does a doctor who's a clinical microbiologist do, I often say it's a bit like CSI. My job is to try and figure out 
where a bug or a bacteria has come from and how to kill it. So your surgery is surgery of the brain and spinal cord and to a lesser degree the peripheral nerves. So a lot of our work here is actually opening the head. The types of operations we do are brain tumours, patients have brain haemorrhages or trauma. So I suppose trauma and orthopaedic surgery in, in Ireland involves anything from the neck down. We'd be involved in road traffic accidents. We do occasionally cover pitch side events when we're doing matches and things like that. Um, so I'd see patients who are acutely injured and then we definitively fix them either later that day or usually within the next 24 hours. Hi, and I hope you found episode one informative and educational. We're just taking your questions and uh, we'll hopefully be able to answer as many as we can. Now, we've had a lot in during the program, so please, we won't get to all of them. Um, first of all, I just want to thank uh, Fergal, Emma and Paul for helping out with this evening's program and letting us see their busy and fascinating lives. Let's just go to the first uh, question. We've got a question from Aoife and Limerick. And Aoife says, uh, what did you specialise in? And uh, if you were going to go back, would you do the same thing again? I myself, I specialise in breast cancer surgery and general surgery. I would definitely go back and do the same thing. It's been a fascinating journey. The changes and the progress in breast cancer treatment has been really exciting for me. Let's go to another question. Um, David in Dublin says, what Leaving Cert science subjects did you do and are there any you would recommend taking on in the Leaving Cert that would help you when it comes to studying medicine? And he says, is it a big disadvantage if he's not studying physics, chemistry and biology? Well, David, I'm sorry, you have to be doing at least one of them uh, to get into medical school. So definitely one of them and uh, chemistry would be helpful to do of the three. So definitely one of those has to be done. Got a question on Facebook here from Aaron in Loud. He asks, do you feel a lot of pressure in college? And do you think that the years of college are too much or too little? Well, Aaron, I don't think there's any pressure in college. College is a wonderful time. Yes, you have to work hard in any college course you're at, but I, I think there's a great social life in college. It's a really formative part of your life, and uh, you're definitely going to enjoy it no matter where you are. So I, I don't think the pressure is a big issue. I'm just going to a question here. Let me just look at it. Uh, Neve says, Neve, obviously being influenced by Fergal Malone, how do I go about specializing in obstetrics and gynecology? It's a great career. So what you do is you graduate as a doctor, and then after your internship, you choose to do obstetrics and gynecology. You train specifically with the likes of Fergal Malone and do a number of years training, and that's a wonderful career, delivering babies, uh, looking after women uh, specifically. So that's... Another question here uh, from Dina on Twitter. Um, can you travel as a doctor? Yes, a lot. And you can travel in your training. I, in my working life at the moment, do a lot of travel to our other medical schools. So uh, that's travel to the Middle East and to the Far East. But it differs for everybody. You can travel to remain educated. You can go to meetings in America. So it's a, it's a great career. Going to Rachel has a question in here on Facebook. Breaking bad news to patients and family. We do get um, specific training in our career on breaking bad news. That's an important part. Communication is really one of the most important things you do as a doctor. Uh, in medical school, we have a specific training program in that to help people. Yasmin has a question here. Uh, how do you manage your time as a doctor? And uh, do you manage? Well, we actually get trained again as a doctor to manage your time. And you know, I think the most important time uh, is the time you manage in being with your uh, patients and s having time for your patients. That's really, really important. But also, um, time with your family is pretty important too, so th they're all important. Here's a question in, do I agree with HPAT? Well, HPAT was brought in by Minister Hannafin to uh, many, many years ago to increase the diversity of access to medical schools. And it has done that, but unfortunately the downside of HPAT is it's another subject, if you like, in the Leaving Cert that you need to study for. And I think that's an extra burden. So there's pros and cons of it. It has been brought in to try and widen access. That's been beneficial, but it's another, um, it's another exam to do. And I, I must say, Section 3 of HPAT I think is complete and utter nonsense, but that's uh, not all the questions that you do in your Leaving Cert are appropriate to evaluate new if you do geography, I don't think learning cloud formation has anything to do with being a doctor, but if you, know, if you do well in geography, you get your points for getting in. Another question uh, coming in, we've got one from uh, Joanna, and Joanna says, is there a specific personality to suit the different specialties of medicine? Yes, I think there is, um, 
and you'll find that out whether which personality that you have might suit your career. Um, I think confidence is important. Yes, as a surgeon, you need to be confident. As an obstetrician, you certainly need to be nice. You need to be inquisitive and interested. If you're going to be a psychiatrist, and you need to be interested in patients if you're going to be a, a GP. So there's lots and lots uh, of different personalities. There's one for everybody. There's a career for everybody. So a, a degree in medicine, um, it allows you to do lots of different careers. Hannah has a question here about what about the long working hours? Um, I myself work long hours, but I enjoy them. Um, so I think if you're thinking of a career in medicine, it's possible to work part-time as well. You can have a career that, um, where you're working part-time. You can choose and dictate what type of um, work you want to do and the number of hours. So in a modern era, people can choose what type of hours they're doing. So even in surgical training now, we have people who work flexi-time and part-time. So I think those options are available. Just going to move on. Uh, we've got a question uh, from, from Tom in the UK. Tom, he's just emailed and said, what is Dublin like as a city to study in? And uh, what is it like to work in hospitals over there? Well, Tom, I think Dublin's a great city. Uh, if you're studying here at RCSI, you're right in the city centre in Stevens Green, near all the shopping districts, so it's a fun place to study. Uh, Dublin has the usual problems with traffic as anyone, but with the same weather as you have in the UK, we're not that far apart, so yes, it is a fun city to, st to study in. Um, a question from Aoife in County Carlow. What are the biggest rewards you get from being a doctor? Um, I personally think the biggest reward is the interaction you have with your patients when you do something for them, and um, I, I just think that's a wonderful moment when you know you've done something for somebody else, um, and that's pretty special uh, to do that. It's certainly, I never get bored in what I do. Um, here's a question from Jean coming in via email. Um, what do when do students choose a specialty? Well, you choose it really during your intern year. So you get a good idea as your uh, in your final med year, but then in your intern year you have to choose. You may take a little bit longer to choose. You can go into certain specialties then move on to other ones, uh, but generally by your intern year uh, you would be choosing one. Got a question coming in here on the live feed. Fergal in Wexford, um, what are the advantages of RCSI over other colleges? Well, I think the major strength of RCSI is the alumni network. So when you join here, you're not just getting a degree, you're getting a career. You have 20,000 alumni all around the world who welcome you and support you both in your training and in your um, career afterwards. They give you opportunities, so you might choose to do some of your training in America or Australia. Uh, we have a huge network of alumni. That's one of our major strengths. But I'm really biased. I think we're a great medical school because I'm head of it, and we're really proud of all our graduates. So a question here from Hannah coming in. Just look, Hannah's asking about neurosurgery. Well, Hannah, that's going to be on the next episode on the 9th of December. So if you tune in on Wednesday the 9th of December at 6 p.m., we've got David O'Brien, who's one of our expert neurosurgeons. Um, here's a question from Sean in Galway asked on Facebook. Um, do you find it hard to shut off after work or after the long hours? Um, I actually think it's easier at work. I've got four teenage sons, and uh, it's probably often easier to be at work than looking after them at home, so I don't envy my wife. But when I do get home, the way I shut off, I, I do um, uh, running. Um, I do a 10K every Sunday. Not very good at it, but that's what I do to shut off. I think everybody has different things. Depends on what age you are and how fit you are. Um, there is a question here coming in. Is there anything that you wish you had known about being a doctor before you decided to study medicine? Um, I think it would have been nice to know and get a flavor of how interactive it is and how special it is, the relationship you have with your patients. That's something that you really only pick up when you're working. Um, the information you give to your patients and how dependent they become I think that's a really special relationship that I, I certainly cherish. Here's a question coming in from David on email. Uh, is it hard to keep up sports while studying medicine? Uh, no. We've got uh, over 70 societies here in our medical school, uh, very active rugby clubs, soccer clubs, 
And I actually think it's really important to maintain, if you're interested in sport, you've got to be a balanced individual. So we do not support somebody who just studies all the time. It's really important to have a balance in your life. So we really encourage people. We've had lots of sporting heroes in our college. We've had Felipe Contiponi graduated here, and he made Leinster be successful, unlike they were last weekend. So uh, thank you to Felipe for all he did. Kira asks, what are the options for research in medicine? Definitely available here in RCSI and in other medical schools. An important part of your training, actually, to do research. So um, research is what makes a difference for the next generation. So if you don't do research, you're not advancing our knowledge. So it's certainly encouraged in all careers um, to do um, research. Let's just go into the um, next question. Um, Yasmin asks, how do you manage your time as a doctor? Well, that's something we train everybody in how to manage their own um, time. Uh, I think it's like in any profession. You've got to be disciplined and decide what you're going to do uh, and how you manage your time. And that comes even as a student. We encourage people to manage their time and ensure they get play time and study time and balance their life. Kate has a question uh, e here on email. Kate, thank you for the question. Opportunities for work experience in the US and Australia. Well, they're huge. As I mentioned, we have a huge alumni network. Uh, many of our graduates choose to work in, uh, in the United States. I spent four years working there myself. It was a fantastic time. Nearly stayed. It was very enjoyable, um, but chose to come home. Uh, Australia, as you know, many of our doctors after they graduate choose to go and work in Australia for a year or so. Uh, it's a great opportunity, wonderful country, wonderful climate, um, and very similar ethos to working here in Ireland. Uh, how many places do we have in RCSI for Leaving Cert students? We have 84 Irish students in every year, 39 are direct entry of the uh, CAO, we have 30 graduate entry medicine places and we have 16 mature entry uh, places. So Lloyd has a question here from Belfast, how many years does it take to become a fully qualified doctor after studying medicine? Uh, well, we it's five years in medicine here, there is a six-year program as well for some, but it takes one year as an intern afterwards. And then uh, after the internship, you choose your specialty, and there are a number of years depending on the uh, discipline. So that's all we have for our uh, first episode. Uh, please let, let us know what you thought. Keep your questions coming in. We'll try to get the answers out to you in the next episode. The details, again, are Facebook, Twitter, hashtag RCSI Be a Doc, and email us on beadoc at rcsi.ie. Finally, please put Wednesday the 9th of December at 6 p.m. into your diary. I'll be back with the second episode of So You Want to Be a Doctor. And for more information on this series, go to www.rcsi.ie forward slash beadoc. Thank you for tuning in, and thank you for all your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but let's try and address them on our next episode, Wednesday the 9th of December at 6 p.m. Thank you very much for your participation.